when we found originally, and by we, it wasn't me, it was Mike and others, um, he tried to do in utero CDH repairs by doing what we do postnatally, which was fixing the hole in the diaphragm. And uh, unfortunately, this was too big of an operation. Uh, we had too much preterm labor, you had kinking of the hepatic veins, and uh, um, outcome was very poor, unfortunately. So uh, this put a, a halt on that process, um, but then folks here and also Jay Wilson at Boston Children's Hospital were looking at perhaps other ways of making the lung grow, and principally through studying this very, very rare disease called congenital high airway obstruction syndrome, or CHAOS for short, where there's a blockage or absence of the trachea, fetuses that are diagnosed with this present with on ultrasound with um, huge lungs. And basically, I just think of it as, as pressure lung, uh, pressure-driven growth. It's kind of like uh, traction elongation of long bones. You know, you get fluid uh, uh, buildup in the lungs. There's no fluid egress throughout through the trachea, and then the lungs sort of grow um, because of the internal pressure-driven growth. And so that led to the thought that, well, if, if these fetuses with tracheal occlusion, because of tracheal atresia, have big lungs, could we then uh, make this happen um, and drive lung growth and treat the underlying problem of CDH and not the anatomic defect? And the answer to that through, again, multiple animal experiments uh, proved to be probably yes. We would make a laparotomy incision on the pregnant woman, uh, and through a small um, hysteroscopic uh, incision, uh, guide a scope uh, into the mouth and then into the trachea of the fetus, and then through the side port, uh, put a detachable balloon that we would leave behind in the trachea. And that would occlude the trachea and then uh, thereby cause pressure-driven lung growth. And I'll show you just a brief picture. So we've gotten into the mouth, and so we're in the oropharynx here of a fetus, and we're trying to get this uh, device uh, so that Chris can blow up this balloon in the fetal uh, trachea. So you can see we're in the trachea now. We sort of magically go from outside the uterus. So for those of you who have intubated patients, uh, we're trying to intubate a patient who's in a big sack of water floating freely with a metal device. So it's a little bit tricky. Uh, we use some ultrasound guidance for this, uh, as well as our fetoscopic guidance. And then uh, we basically um, uh, do what you would never do in uh, a postnatal patient, which is to completely occlude the trachea. We can do this because, of course, they have placental bypass, so they get uh, oxygenation uh, from the placenta. And there you can see the balloon being blown up, and the catheter portion uh, detaches. And uh, you know, so we have, uh, at this point, our radiology ultrasound colleagues as well as our neuro and ventral colleagues. And then we are done with the procedure. So did this work? Well, the initial, I think, 15 patients uh, from an expected mortality of 75%, we had 75% survival. So we made the mistake of saying we're going to prove that this works by getting an NIH-funded uh, study to, in a prospective randomized control fashion, study standard postnatal care versus uh, fetal balloon tracheal occlusion. Now the question is, how do you deliver these babies? And so we had to invent a way of delivering them. It's called an exit procedure where we do sort of half of a C-section, leave the umbilical cord attached, remove the balloon, and then completely deliver the baby. Unfortunately, there was no statistically significant difference between the uh, control group and the experimental group. That is, no difference between the standard postnatal care group and the group that had fetal tracheal occlusion. Uh, survival was about 70% in both. And the question is, why is that? Well, um, the answer to that is, is that, uh, and we published this in the New England Journal, and the answer to that was probably, there was probably some benefit for the lung growth in the experimental group, but probably offset by the preterm labor in the experimental group. So what we thought we would have of mortality or of survival in the control group, we thought we'd have about a 30% survival. We, in fact, had 75% survival in the control group. So this sort of demonstrated a trial effect. You get you know, these patients who would have otherwise been treated elsewhere uh, come to UCSF, which is probably the busiest CDH center in the country, and we have our excellent neonatal colleagues take care of them. And the lesson was that postnatal care at UCSF was probably the biggest determinant of uh, survival. 
So did this deter us? Well, we've further sort of stratified this disease so that I think that we now do have the group of patients that we're actually going to do. We further tweak the uh, procedure where we now do the entire thing percutaneously. We actually remove the balloon percutaneously through a second fetoscopic operation eight weeks later so that the fetuses can literally and figuratively take a breath before birth. That seems to be important for several reasons. Number one, you can deliver them by a vaginal delivery, which is better than doing a C-section delivery. And number two, when you have tracheal occlusion throughout the remainder of pregnancy, it suppresses type 2 pneumocyte production, and therefore you have decreased surfactant production at birth. When you um, reverse the tracheal occlusion, even a day before, you get return of surfactant production. So for all those reasons, less invasive, uh, better surfactant production, vaginal delivery, uh, we feel that, that uh, this is promising.